Um, you know what? That's a great question. We'll have that answered here in a moment because, Dave, we do now finally have uh, Dr. Richard Pan joining oh, us here awesome. right now. And uh, we're anxious to have him each and every Friday. So generous with his time last week. Dr. Pan, thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? I'm doing all right. Uh, how are you? Uh, we're, we're good. And uh, we'll start with something we were just talking about. We uh, Americans generally take a lot of pride in being number one in, in whatever we can be number one in. We're not very happy that we're number one, unfortunately, now, doctor, in uh, where we are with the coronavirus pandemic. It's number one. Uh, the U.S. is the number one most cases now. So just kind of a general overview before we get into all of our questions, where we are this Friday compared to when we had you on last Friday. Well, um, as you can see, uh, we are increasing the number of cases, uh, as uh, the uh, governor has indicated, or his uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, the uh, rate of doubling is happening uh, probably about every uh, three or four days. And so when you start doing the math, uh, you can see that there's uh, going to be an increased number of cases, and you can see what's happening in the rest of the country, like New York City. Uh, now New Orleans and even uh, other states as well. So uh, it's the wave is on the way. Uh, it hasn't really hit Sacramento yet, even though we were the first uh, city to have someone in the hospital uh, who had community spread of coronavirus. So let's just all keep working at our uh, physical distancing and uh, you know, washing our hands and all that stuff that we need to do to keep the uh, virus from spreading. Dr. Pan, we've got a lot of questions, uh, uh, which is great uh, for you from from listeners. Sure. Uh, I want I want to start with one um, that you and I talked a little bit about earlier this week, and and that we we previewed on the show earlier. I, I saw. I'll, I'll make this personal, but this applies to a lot of people. Um, I'm seeing more mm-hmm. and more people looking at Mardi Gras in New Orleans as as part of the outbreak down in Louisiana. M- my wife and I were in New Orleans for the very first Mardi Gras uh, uh, floats uh, in February and then went on a cruise, which is like probably the two worst things you could do trying to avoid the virus. Uh, and then I was sick for about a week and a half after. Uh, she was mm-hmm. sick for about a week after that. I think there's a lot of people like myself that wonder, if we've already had it. So my question is kind of two-part. Number one, uh, mm-hmm. lack of testing availability aside, is there a way for people or will there be a way for people who may have had it and recovered to find out if they ever had it? And then number two, I think most importantly, for the wave of people that, that hopefully and thankfully will be recovering, what is there or is there any sort of immunity figured out going forward or should they still take the same precautions somebody who hasn't gotten it is? Right. So first of all, uh, hopefully we will eventually be able to figure out uh, who is, uh, who's had the, the disease. The current tests that we do actually detect whether people uh, currently have the illness or currently are infected. So it's uh, not a test that can tell you whether you had the disease and already recovered. Uh, we eventually will figure that out. Uh, but uh, we're not there yet. As I mentioned last week, this is a new virus, and there's still things we're figuring out about it, including uh, how we respond. In terms of um, after you've recovered from this disease, uh, even if you know you've had it, uh, we still don't know for sure if people are immune and how long they stay immune. We, uh, I think... Most indications are people have developed immunity uh, to this disease after they've had it. Uh, We don't know how long that immunity lasts. Uh, Most coronaviruses, people are immune for, uh, I say coronaviruses, other similar viruses, the ones that are in the same class, that people are immune for at least uh, uh, several years. Uh, But we don't know about this particular virus. That's one of the things we still have to figure out. Uh, The other thing... that sort of leads to do we know what happens after you recover is that um, we don't know, for example, people are looking at antibody tests because that will tell you whether you had the disease, but exactly how many uh, antibodies you need to have to stay immune. So that's something we still have to figure out. And uh, so that means that it, even if you've had the disease or you thought you had the disease and you recovered, we still need people to everyone to do the same thing until we figure this out. So that's one of those things we still have to figure out. Dr. Richard Pan with us here. One Another one coming in from one of our listeners. Question for you is, is it safe for my 61-year-old mom 
to babysit my two kids at her place or mine when we both have been isolating? Well, what we want to try to do is minimize the uh, spread of the disease. So, uh, so is it safe for your 61-year-old mom to watch your kids? Um, I guess I'd say is that if you, if basically your mom and your kids uh, are being very careful about not interacting with other people, and neither one is feeling ill, uh, it has a fever or dry cough or any of these other symptoms, uh, and you're all isolating, then I think it's uh, probably uh, okay. Um, again, this is really about trying to slow the spread of the disease and uh, keeping uh, to ourselves as much as possible uh, in terms of physical contact. We want people to continue to socially engage with each other uh, through uh, remotely by phone or other types of means. We don't want people to be socially isolated. But again, this is about slowing the spread of the disease. Certainly, if someone is feeling ill, uh, especially with uh, uh, your grandmother, probably should try to keep them away from your grandmother. Dr. Richard Pan with us. Uh, Doc, this this question off of Twitter, and this, mm-hmm. this is a real popular question. It's something <clears throat> you're seeing a lot on social media. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, for example... Doc, come on, Uh, you know, we had the H1N1 a decade ago, and there were tens of thousands of people that died and millions that were infected, and we didn't shut everything down. We've got, like, 1,200 people in America out of 350 million that have died. That sucks, but it's nowhere near what it was back in 2009. Why are we freaking out now and doing all this stuff that's unprecedented when, when we didn't do that for any of these before? What is the difference between back then and now, and why are these precautions necessary now? So this is a new virus for which we have no treatment for. Uh, so sorry, chloroquine has not uh, been proven as a effective treatment Uh And, in fact, it can be toxic if you take the wrong dose. Uh, We have no vaccine for, uh, and as it's spreading through our community, uh, very few people uh, have immunity. And the only way to get immunity is if you get infected. The other thing to keep in mind is, is that so far it looks like the hospitalization rate for this disease is somewhere between probably around 15%, people say between 10 and 20%. Uh, So... Even for younger people, so we often talk about the older people being the ones being at higher risk of death, uh, even younger people uh, with a you know, 15% hospitalization rate, what we could do is very easily uh, overrun our hospitals. The people who end up in the hospital oftentimes need ventilators. Uh, they certainly need uh, medical personnel. And, um, and then the death rate for this uh, infection is... Uh, anywhere, you know, one, 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 one to three percent. So now when you start doing the math and you start looking at the law of large numbers, okay, we have 40 million people here in California. And so uh, the question is, for example, how uh, this disease, well, different projections say that, you know, 40 to 70 percent of people will be infected. So let's just say half because it's easier to do the math. That's 20 million people. Uh, with a 1% death rate, and that's a good number, that's a lower number, that's 200,000 people uh, dead uh, if you just let it spread. If you think about the uh, hospitalization rate of uh, 10, you know, about 15%, you know, again, do the math, then you start figuring out how many hospital beds we have, how many ventilators we have. And then what you figure out is like, oh, my God we're going to not have enough hospital beds or ventilators if everyone got sick at the same time or approximately the same time. Then you have a situation like you saw in Italy. And then what happens, the death rate goes up because that death rate of 1% was if everyone could get medical care. Uh, Now they can't because the hospitals are full. There's not enough ventilators. Uh, In New York right now, they did this in Italy too. They're putting two people on a ventilator machine. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's not something you normally do, but I guess if your other choice is letting one of them die, you try that, right? Um, that's what we're facing. This uh, infection, 
so when people say about the flu, yes, uh, a lot of people every year die from the flu. Uh, we have a way to try to prevent it, flu shots. Uh, unfortunately, uh, only about half of us or a little under half of us actually get them every year. Uh, we have a treatment for it, Tamiflu, that can help out if you got infected. Uh, this virus, we don't have either one. Uh, and uh, if we let it spread, we will overrun our hospitals and uh, people will die. And so I think for that, we better take it pretty seriously. And that's why we are having a stay at home order. That's why we're asking people to do everything they can because each one of us is on the front line of slowing this disease. And so if um, a group of us decide that we're not going to do that, that puts everyone else at risk. And then what happens is that our first responders, our doctors and our nurses and our hospitals are the backup line that fills in the gaps for all the people who aren't doing what they need to do to stop the spread of this disease. Well said as we're being joined by Dr. Richard Pan here. Uh, I, I agree. I think there's always, we, we see people on the news or on social media that aren't maybe being as responsible as what I would say is the majority. So if we just take our community here, I know a lot of people are staying to those orders, staying at home and doing what is, quote, the essentials. Maybe it's a, a trip once or twice a week to the grocery store, maybe picking up mm -hmm. a curbside to go. For those people that are hopefully doing the right thing, we'll say the right thing, the responsible thing, and have been quarantined now maybe for a week, almost two weeks, and show no symptoms, at this point, should they feel good about that, that at what they've done in precautions and what they've done at the store and limited action outside, that should they feel good about where they are at this point? Well, they should feel good about doing what they need to do to help all of us, including protecting themselves and their own family. So when you look at what's going on right now in Sacramento, and I'm going to say that things will probably start looking worse over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but if you think about the fact that we started off with the first case of community spread happened uh, with someone in Northern California who was then hospitalized in Sacramento. And then you see what's going on even just in the rest of the country and how they've actually uh, caught up and surpassed us in number of cases, in number of hospitalizations, uh, uh, number of deaths. Um, we, you know, and then you think that we could have been like them already right now, and we haven't yet. I think we should be very proud of ourselves, but we need to keep doing this. Unfortunately, we still don't have you know, a treatment. We still don't have a vaccine. Um, this is what we got, and we still need to get more testing, and we've actually ramped up a lot of testing, right? And uh, we still have other things we need to do, but uh, people are doing what they need to do. We need to encourage everyone to do that. Let's hold the line. Dr. Richard Pan with us. You know, Dr. Pan became, and I explained this before he came on last week, a hero of mine. I, I'm very passionate about vaccinations and, and protecting our children and our community. And I don't know that anybody has done more to advance that cause than Dr. Pan, not just through his medical experience, but also being a state senator. Uh, there's a, a term being thrown around in times like this. And, Doc, mm -hmm. I know you'll you'll know this answer better than anyone. Could you give us a, a – I'm sure it's a long answer, but a, a, as, as, as uh, you know, layperson as possible, an explanation as to what herd immunity is. And is herd immunity something that we hope eventually – uh, will help dispel this virus? So uh, herd immunity, or what I call community immunity, when you have enough people in the community who are immune to a disease, uh, that then prevents it from being able to spread. So if someone is infected and everyone around them is immune, then the disease can't go anywhere, right? Uh, so it can't spread it to other people who, it makes them, more difficult for, to, for it to spread to someone who's not immune because they're so surrounded by people who are immune. The challenge with uh, this disease is the only way for someone to develop immunity, and uh, again, as you mentioned, asked me in the first question, we hope that when someone recovers, they're immune for several years, uh, at least, if not longer, uh, then the only way to get that immunity is for actually people to get infected and to risk you know, hospitalization or even death from being infected. Um, we don't have any other alternative to, to do that. So uh, we will eventually uh, develop at least some limited uh, community immunity when this virus spreads far enough. Uh, we don't want everyone to get infected at the same time because we don't want our hospitals to get overrun. We don't want people to die because they can't get medical care. Um, but 
uh, that's the only way we're going to get it at the moment until someone develops an alternative. That's usually, that's a vaccination, right? So that a vaccine is a way to get immunity without actually having to get the disease itself. And so we, uh, people are working on vaccines, uh, probably 18 months at the shortest. I will just, in case people are like wondering, well, do we have to keep doing what we're doing now for, you know, 18 months until the vaccine shows up? Uh, hopefully with greater testing, uh, which we can adopt the strategy more like what we see in some of the countries in Asia that have been more successful in controlling this, uh, which will allow us to more in a targeted way, uh, perhaps lift some of the restrictions because we can better identify who's had the disease and who doesn't. Um, so uh, we definitely need to ramp up testing. Uh, right now, we, we, you know, we're working on that. Uh, but yes, eventually the solution will be to achieve herd immunity, a community immunity uh, through uh, vaccination in terms of trying to stop this uh, disease. Well, it's uh, frightening times, but hopefully everybody uh, heeds your words there and is safe, is smart, protects themselves, protects them, their families. Dr. Richard Pan, we thank you so much for joining us, giving us your time again this week, and we look forward to talking to you next Friday. Of course. Thank you so very much, Dave.